I would like to welcome you to the um, amazing uh, talk about the affective states of exception. I'm proud and honored and delighted as well to, uh, uh, to introduce the uh, members of the Oramix um, collective, feminist queer co um, uh, collective from Poland. I will briefly introduce the, 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 the today's uh, speakers. Then we will talk a little bit. You can ask your questions via YouTube, via Facebook, uh, wherever you watch us. And then we're gonna try to um, discuss. And also after the uh, panel discussion, which will end at 7.30 uh, tonight, you are more than welcomed to, to join us to, uh, at the server of the CTM, the Discord, the CTM Discord um, uh, server, where you can still uh, continue um, uh, talking with the Oramix members and follow on the discussion. So normally I would invite everybody to, 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 to give the um, a round of applause. But as we are uh, without the audience in this Zoom uh, window, I can just welcome you all like this. And I will start introducing from, uh, from my left. So Doghead Surigari is our first guest. Uh, she's a Polish DJ uh, currently living in The Hague. She co-creates the Mestizo, uh, I hope I pronounced it well, crew, which uh, for the last four years has been trying to redefine music and club culture. Since 2018, um, uh, she's been a member of Oramix. By the way, Oramix was created in 2017. Uh, and Oramix, as we all know already, is the initiative that supports the participation of women and queer people and non-binary people uh, and communities in the clubbing sen, uh, scene. She performed in different clubs all over Poland, in various festivals, also in London and uh, Amsterdam and Bratislava. Her sets are hybrid with rhythmic switch-ups, blending Cut up the constructed club music with trap, UK bass, abstract techno, and EDM snippets. That was quite an exercise. Uh, Non-linearity rages through the machines. Cyclonic torsion moans born under Scorpio zodiac sign. Yeah, um, she's ruled by um, impulsiveness and passion, which reflects in everything she does. So let's welcome uh, Doket Surigeri, and now we continue with the introductions. Um, further on, we have uh, we have uh, Mala Herba Zosia. Uh, she's a solo project of a sound artist and queer music activist, uh, Zosia Holubowska. I'm sorry, I try to make the English pronunciation already. Based uh, in traditional music, magic, and the monology of Eastern Europe, beware. Uh, Mala Herba explores queerness and sex positivity. Powerful witchy vocals are weaved into hypnotic beats, cold bass lines and romantic synthesizers uh, melodies. There is something gothic and dramatic to it, but nevertheless, this makes you dance. She announces also that uh, there is some Italo disco possible to um, find in her, uh, in her work. Her tape Mat Transformers uh, uh, published, uh, record published in December 2017 is no longer available. It was sold out, uh, all 80 copies of it, together with various herbs. Uh, I'm happy to, 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 uh, to, to have you here with us on, on the stage. Um, then we have, uh, then we have uh, Mon Molly Monster, Monster Molly? Molly Monster, how do I do it? Um, a, a part of Polish queer feminist club collective Oramix as well. She's been, oh my God, tearing up dance floors like a beast, blending house techno trance breaks and occasional edits of pop hits. We have actually quite a similar background in the sense that uh, she's been first playing at the Rosbrad Squad in Poznan, um, making a fantastic effort, I think, trying to combine the activist scene with the um, electronic music um, uh, listeners and practitioners. So um, in 2018, um, her guest mix for Lisbon label Naive caught the attention of Philip Sherber, who in, uh, included it in the round, roundup of best mixes of Pitchfork. Um, in 2020, she's been collaborating with the re resident advisor Mixmag Lobster Teremin. Um, she's also at the project lab um, she's been DJing and also giving workshops uh, of DJing with some feminist focus. So the sort of activist part continues on. And uh, her works uh, are also featured in the CTM, uh, 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 CTM festival. Uh, uh, welcome and very nice. I'm very pleased to meet you and we'll talk more soon. And there is also Aftomat. 
uh, whom I met at the Unsound discussion about queer uh, responses to the Polish politics uh, already. Aftermath is a man with way too many interests. I love this introduction line. Uh, an openly queer composer, producer, DJ and vocalist, proud member of the Oramix again, and Ciężki Brokat. Ciężki Brokat is heavy glitter in English. Uh, Cruz, a co-creator of Radio Capital, a very important uh, progressive radio, um, online radio in Poland. He's also the Polish ambassador for key change, but also a graphic designer, typographer and 3D illustrator. His own music has morphed several times throughout the last 10 years from purely synthetic timbers, throughout emotive polyphonic vocal compositions with band Pleśni, um, so rotten something, I would translate it, to a perplexing fusion of rhythmically and sonically jacked bass-heavy club tracks on his latest EP, Guswa, which is human rights as like rights, um, traditional rights, let's say like this. Um, so he was playing in various uh, festivals, obviously, um, and Modern Art Days in Białystok, for instance, but also in Unsound, Nova Muzyka and other places. So I'm super happy to have you all here. And I must honestly say it's a very touching moment for me. And I already warned our guests that I will behave a little bit like this kind of uh, elderly auntie, uh, which is a terrible behavior at uh, Club Transmediale Festival. And Oliver will never forgive me. And probably this is the last time I'm ever doing anything with the... Uh, uh, CTM because of this behavior, but I'm really touched because 20 years ago when I was doing my own sort of small encounter with techno, it was the times when in order to let women speak, we would have to shout at guys to shut up so that women can talk. So now uh, hosting in this discussion a, a feminist queer collective it makes a, a whole world of a difference. It makes me think of those 20 years of various struggles my own, but also I know more or less your histories, so also your struggles. And I see how they translated into a very different vibe of um, techno scene, electronic music scene, activism, contemporary art scene. So I'm very proud to see all those changes. And that gives me hope that maybe in the next 20 years, there will be, you will be in this position that I occupy right now. And you will see some other amazing collective that uh, embraces all those um, uh, you know, political strategies and egalitarian practices that you are fight, fighting or struggling for right now. So it's a very touching moment. And um, so when I mentioned my first encounters with techno, it was 20 years ago in the Most Grota Robeckiego. I'm not sure, but you might remember um, the kind of legendary Warsaw techno parties that happened several times in, around the year 1999, which hosted some thousands of um, people and had no permission whatsoever. Like nothing was actually registered in any way. Uh, so these were the nice moments of, of techno in Warsaw. And then we were using still the um, ancient theories of the right to the city, the derive, the situationist kind of flannery. So this was the approach that we've had and we were discovering spaces where we wanted simply to either play the music or dance or make other sort of social cultural events. <clears throat> so this was the attitude. So I believe right now it has evolved tremendously. And uh, festivals, records, labels, and all those things that you, are, you guys are doing are much more advanced kind of media than the ones we disposed of. So basically, let's go to the, to the topic of tonight's uh, discussion, which is quite heavy because it recalls the fascist days. And unfortunately, this is not something I'm very enthusiastic about, but I still have to you know, have the enthusiastic note, so I'll continue on it. However, the state of exception politics is something uh, we all, I think, were learning in schools that uh, will never repeat itself. And then suddenly we find ourselves since 2015, at least in Poland, which is governed exactly towards the direction of some sort of, or some version of fascist regime. Uh, I believe that, um, especially for queer people and non-binary people, and also for women, um, this kind of state of exception politics touches us very directly. And more generally, the politics of state of exception means that the sovereign authorities are somehow creating laws, but they are not exactly responsible in front of the law. So, the ex so one part of the exception consists in the fact that we have authorities which are creating the law, 
but they are exempt of it. They are not responsible to any legal power whatsoever. And I believe this is pretty much what we are observing on daily basis in Poland today. And then this politics of state of exception consists also in creating an enemy which, with which in the battle, the national identity of the, of the, of the, of the sovereign power is getting bigger and stronger and, and more uh, effective. So basically today, as in 1930s, we had the Jews, for instance, but also gay men, also the Roma populations and other discriminated groups. Today, I, I believe that the non-binary and queer um, LGBTQ people are um, uh, 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 posited in this, in this position of the enemy. And so therefore, uh, the queer initiatives, the pro-feminist, uh, pro-LGBTQ agency on the side of the of the club scene is amazingly important. And uh, I'm very happy to see uh, to, to say that I perceive it as one of the best possible answers to the state of exception. So when I coined the notion of affective state of exception, I was trying to express the fact that not only our government is transforming towards the fascist line, but also we as the population living in Poland, we experience this kind of ban or central LGBTQ uh, free zones, for instance, you know, scandalous facts or legal, uh, uh, legal proposals that are making our emotions immediately jump. So I believe that we've been living for the last five years in a sort of affective state of exception as well, in a sense that we constantly, our organisms, our uh, psyche, our organisms are constantly engaged in very intense emotions on daily basis. And I think this is, uh, in Polish, we have this fantastic idiom, rabunkowa gospodarka na organizmie, so which in English should be like a robbery uh, economy on, on, or, on human organism and human psyche. So basically, I think that our oppositional mindset and our critical mindset is con by being constantly introduced to those heavy emotions and strong emotions, we are exhausting ourselves. And basically, after those last five years, we are also entering into the state of some sort of exhaustion. So I think right now I will pass it on to you with my first question. Uh, we will start maybe from my left again. So I'll ask uh, Dokhet Surigeri to, to answer uh, the first, if you, if you want, obviously. The question will be, what do you understand by solidarity? Do you have a sort of definition, vision of it, you know, a notion that you keep in mind, perhaps um, some inspiration? Uh, historical, theoretical, or otherwise, or, or maybe you don't have it and you have to create it for yourself. That's the question to all of you, obviously. So what is your vision of solidarity? And also what are the practices of solidarity? What, uh, what you do, what, what you think is important in the club scene? Please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Eva, for this uh, really nice introduction. Um, and uh, thank you also CTM Festival uh, for having us here tonight. Uh, well, I must say that your question is uh, very, very broad uh, and it's, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's possible to answer what is solidarity for me, solidarity for me in one uh, sentence. Although what I see recently, what is pretty interesting for me and um, what I see on the streets in Poland, what I also experienced myself when I was there uh, with the crowd, um, it, it's for, sh for sure is the voice which is kind of getting united and um, which is getting much more radicalized in a way than it was before. Um, and you can see all of these people together fighting for the rights. And by this, I also mean that they are not really, that they are just fed up uh, these days. So you can see that the energy is much more stronger, the voice is much more united and these bodies are kind of marching together towards one goal. And I think it is the, the first time, at least for me personally, I see such a huge movement. Um, yeah, just kind of taking over the streets. Um, mm -hmm. So that's for me very, very shortly. I would like to jump in later. And yeah, maybe someone else would like to add something. Thank you so much. Um, Mala Herba, Zosia, if you want to uh, continue. Uh, sure. And I will just second point. I would saying that we're all very happy uh, 
to be a part of the CTM and having such a wonderful introduction by you, Eva. Uh, for me, solidarity is very closely linked to intersectionality and building alliances between groups, uh, much more than the politics of identity. And um, I think in our context, it's quite interesting to talk about solidarity because in Poland, it's this... Uh, this idea is so heavily charged because of history and something that uh, we were educated and raised to respect. And uh, we also have to deal with some kind of heritage of a uh, workers' movement that also later on got completely deconstructed. And uh, nowadays, uh, it's not always something that um, gets praised anonymous and yeah, without question. <laughs> Too difficult word. Um, and you know what I mean. Um, and on the other hand, I used to be very critical towards the the idea of solidarity because you always have to ask yourself like who is solidar with whom? And also the the kind of the question of um, the politics of attention nowadays that sometimes it's so difficult to actually um, put your message across and gain some international traction and ask for solidarity, especially we've seen it in the, in our case in Poland, that uh, even though the situation is like getting, you know, more and more dire, there hasn't been like this uh, wild and constant uh, attention coming from the West. I mean, yes, occasionally, but I think solidarity can't be just a singular spark. It has to be something more consistent in order to really uh, make a change and uh, put some pressure. But to finish on a, a bit more positive note, like Paulina says, uh, I am really surprised and very overjoyed to see uh, this alliances and this connection being built in Poland, you know, between taxi drivers and queer kids and uh, and so many different groups coming together. And uh, yeah, they're putting their differences a little bit inside and focusing on the common agenda rather than uh, on the differences between their identities. And I, some people said that this... Uh, Last summer we had the Polish Stonewall, but I would much rather see, uh, you know, to uh, see Polish um, gays for minors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the British variation of it. The yeah. British variation, yeah. I was even thinking of the October Revolution in October, but yeah, that's a different, <laughs> different story. Thank you so much, Zosia. I will pass it on uh, to Molly Monster. Uh, please, if you want to add uh, to solidarity notions and visions. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to say hi now and thank you for having us and for the lovely introduction. Um, I, 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 I uh, agree with Zosha a lot um, when it comes to the notion of organizing uh, between different communities and um, different groups of people. That always has been solidarity for me. Like like Zosha mentioned, the word solidarity has been completely um, washed out in in Polish um, language because of the trade union that betrayed the working class. So um, so I I do feel like especially when it comes to trade unions, like we have to rebuild everything because the idea of trade unions was just completely lost over the course of the last 40 years now. Um, so yeah, and then when it comes to, like I was kind of thinking about like clubs um, and like what, what, like how can we show solidarity there? Um, I feel like solidarity is also like giving up some of your space where you feel comfortable because maybe you're in a privileged position um, or even risk, sometimes, you know, risk your safety when you're like protesting in the street and then, you know, uh, getting yourself arrested instead of someone weaker that you can see in the, like, you know, behind. Um, but yeah, when it comes to clubs, like, um, you know, like a lot, like, uh, yeah, also speaking of the attention, like, um, we also have to know at which point are we, you know, like as DJs and like uh, in, a, in a culture that, that's like heavily, heavily individu individualized. Um, can we share our, our spotlight? Can we give it up for other people that actually need it? That for many years didn't have, you know, um, a chance to do it, but they also didn't see people like them 
-hmm. you know, performing in certain spaces and so on. So I think when it comes to like clubs, which is, you know, some of our, some of the areas where we work, like where we mostly work, um, yeah, creating safer spaces together with, you know, club owners, club managers, uh, um, organizing workshops and, you know, always taking care of the fact that, you know, the workshops is not like 90% of men. Um, so that, you know, and then the message of the workshops, like the, the invitation is like very, very invitation is inviting for all sorts of people and also very like, um, and like comforting for people who are scared to be in some environments who like, let's say in the past were dominated by, by just heterosexual men. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I think solidarity is, you know, mm -hmm. just like uh, giving up and sharing some of your space because like, it's like nothing is going to get stolen from you. If you, if you are already in a privileged position, mm -hmm. right. It's, you know, it's important to share. Thank you so much. And uh, there is this concept of uh, empathy. I think being not being like a, like a, like a cake. So basically, if somebody takes some, there is still going to be enough for everyone. Yeah. And if uh, solidarity could fit in this description of of the yeah. cake, which is sort of never ending, yeah, you can always yeah. move a little bit more or reshuffle or whatever. Thank you so much. And uh, after Matt, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh... Really nice to be here, as everybody said. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with um, everything that, that that you said. And um, for me, solidarity, uh, as was as it was mentioned, it, it, it's like it's a term that's been a bit washed out of its meaning in, in Poland because of uh, what's happened throughout the last thirty years. Uh, but uh, we, throughout the last couple of years, we've been we've been uh, constantly reminded what that is. Uh, in in its roots, you know, um, and that is for me, it's it's a constant exchange uh, of of uh, of privilege, as was said, of of uh, um, ideas, of creativity, um, of of your time, of uh, sometimes of your health and and your uh, your freedom. Uh, throughout throughout the last year, we've seen uh, a huge. Um, a huge movement towards uh, intersectional solidarity uh, between women and queer uh, queer crowds um, and other groups that have been underprivileged uh, and underrepresented in our in our public space, which which uh, uh, which we've taken for granted before before the ruling government um, uh, got you know. Uh, all the power that they that they wield right now, and um, I feel that uh, that this like very um, colorful vision of what solidarity is uh, has just been like reborn in, in Poland right now. Um, uh, paradoxically, thanks to the the, the, the oppression that that is uh, being put onto us. So um, yeah, I. I also tend to have a, a, a more positive outlook and I love seeing all the people in the streets and actually um, give giving each other a leg up rather than, than. I'm happy that we can reclaim the notion of solidarity. It has been always very dear to me because I've been looking at Solidarność movement, you know, back in the 80s from a perspective of its diversity, class openness and the am amazing presence of women, for instance. So therefore, when I later saw what became of it, I was in double sense sort of unhappy. First of all, because it was hijacked by the conservative side, but then secondly, because it was hijacked by the masculinity, sort of hegemonic, you know, traditional masculinity, and then all this women who were building up sort of evaporated so basically i think that this queer take on uh, solidarity is a fantastic uh, uh, fantastic option and although it has been kidnapped it's being rearticulated again as a, as a feminist queer um, notion so now i have a more specific question about good examples of solidarity practice from the djing scene like maybe you had a chance to participate in some event or some practice that has been, you know, a life-changing practice, or you have seen something like this and you would like to share what it was, because I believe for all of us and our listeners, it might be interesting to 
you know, to, to, to see what the club scene is, is actually doing. So um, if you have good examples, please bring them on. Um, I would like to also uh, add one more thing because, and then go to your question, Eva. I think what is really interesting that you uh, you were talking about the empathy as a, as a figure uh, in general. And what I would add here is also resources in a way, because, um, and it's a little bit, um, I'm drawing a line to what uh, Molly mentioned about the spotlight and giving away the privilege you have um, and like how you can also kind of uh, distribute what you have. And I think uh, what is also important these days is that you have a lot of platforms uh, all around. You have uh, people who just um, have resources and they can kind of give the res these resources or do something with them or distribute them in a good cause or like use the platform which already have some sort of a spotlight to maybe um, like direct it to the very uh, important cause. So, um, and talking about the good practices and what I mean by resources is for instance, I will here gonna talk about uh, one of uh, Oramic's uh, thing because this is the first things which comes to my mind, but like um, we have like a one ongoing project, uh, which is like a map of queer and uh, female uh, DJs in Poland. And basically it's very simple. It's just a map with a pins. So you have different towns in Poland and then you can see if you're a promoter or a booker, you can just go like hover the city, right? And you can see how many people you can actually book. And why it happened, I think it's because very often when we were talking with some friends just inside the clubs, during the parties, uh, during the events, and uh, we were talking about the fact that women are just like women and queer bodies and in general, like uh, this, this, this group is like um, underrepresented uh, in the music scene. We, we often kind of got this answer. Okay, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anyone, you know, who, who can I book? I don't know anyone who can play. And then we were like, no, that's not true. You know, like, I mean, and that's why we kind of also created the map for all of these people who, mm -hmm just can go and like use the resource pretty, pretty like in a clear way. So I think that might be one of the maybe example of how to use also the platform and the spotlight to create something as a resource that other people can also use and build upon this. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. And it also reminds me of a, an experience of a Polish journalist, uh, Roman Kurtiewicz, who uh, for one whole year in 2013, I think, had this habit of only inviting female um, experts uh, uh, in, in his radio program. And uh, so at first the producers of this radio program were like, come on, but it takes 40 minutes to convince a woman and five minutes to convince a guy to come uh, as an expert. And Roman was like, yeah, so take the 40 minutes, you know, make sure that you have the, the, the 40 minutes because women's reaction usually for coming to a studio for, uh, as an expert was, no, 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 I don't know much about it. You know, my brother knows better, my uh, my son, my husband, whatever, my boss. Uh, so they would try to, you know, deliver, uh, the, uh, try to share this opportunity with some male colleagues. And then, uh, so, so Romek told us in a conference presentation about a whole year of making sure that only women are presented as experts. So I, I like this example very much and I hope this map is available. If you want to share it on, on the chat space, it would be fantastic. And then if anybody, I don't know, Zosia, maybe you have uh, some example? Uh... Uh, I really, really believe in the sharing knowledge and sharing resources as tools. Um, maybe it's a little bit uh, weird, uh, but I wanted to talk about the project that I'm running. It's called Sound Square in Vienna. It's like a flying uh, synthesizer lab where at the beginning uh, we put together our private gear into kind of like a flying lab of synthesizers and started doing uh, workshops uh, mostly for women, non-binary, queer people, but everyone is welcome as long as they understand that, uh, you know, there's some kind of like privilege game at play. Uh, and now uh, we organize monthly workshops on production, um, music theory and songwriting, focusing on electronic music. And uh, yeah, I'm not uh, the one that would like hoard knowledge or hoard the gear and try to like you know, block other people from entering the scene. I'm really interested in diversity and making it happen. 
um, another project that I'm really inspired by. It's more in the punk scene. It's called a First Timer Stage, organized by DIY Space for London. Uh, and it was like um, a program, a, a few months program of workshops that was aimed at actually creating new bands in which at least uh, one, no, I think majority of the band would be from a uh, minority group. So that included also people of color. So there were workshops uh, not only from playing instruments, but also stage fright and songwriting. And um, then at the end of uh, each uh, program of workshops, there was a concert where everyone was playing their first show. Uh, some of these bands actually went on to be quite uh, successful in like the indie garage punk scene. And uh, this this project is uh, very, very inspiring to me. So yeah, share tools. Mm -hmm. share space share stage so then we can have like more representation of diverse bodies and diverse experiences mm -hmm. super thank you so much um molly if you want to add uh, some examples yeah i wanted i wanted to add something about our workshops because <laughs> um yeah um so we do run regular work workshops like we haven't really done anything uh, like in person because of COVID um, for about a year now, but we did some online workshops. But yeah, we've been running workshops for, I think, almost three years, like two, two and a half years in different cities. Um, like I mentioned before, we always made sure, okay, it was funny because when before the first workshop was about to happen, we were worried that the people who were gonna sign up were gonna be mostly men. Because this is what we were told in the past that, you know, girls are not interested or whatever. I've also been to like the, like to events that were called workshops, but they were basically uh, like extremely boring lectures of men looking at their Ableton screen and just sharing it on the wall and believing that anyone, like someone in the room gets what they're talking about. I didn't. Um so our goal was to be the opposite of that. Like our goal was to have every, everyone participate. And yeah, like I said, we're scared. Like what if it's mostly mostly guys? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? And then when we announced the workshops and then we got like, uh, like dozens of emails, it was like, I don't know, 80% uh, women. Because then it, it, it seems like when you, let's say, market your, your product in a way that's like very welcoming and says, we want everyone to feel safe. We want everyone to participate and, you know, have an on hands, uh, uh, sorry, hands on experience. Um, then people are like, well, and then if the lecturer is a woman, that's another thing. But yeah, I, I don't think it matters in our case which is funny, um, and but, yeah. but then, but then, uh, yeah, like a lot of, a lot of uh, women signed up and, and like, we didn't have to like do anything uh, like, you know, cheat or anything because we were like, oh, it's mostly girls who want to do it. Mm -hmm. So I guess it was just an, a myth that uh, women mm -hmm. are not interested. So, yeah. So I do feel like in, in this, like, um, let's say like club community community for for many years there has been th there has been this atmosphere of like gatekeeping you know for like a lot of like new DJs they wouldn't know like you know now we have YouTube and we have tutorials but like do you know which tutorial is is actually good because mm -hmm. there's so many of them and there's so much crap that you actually don't know what to what to learn from but there were like no resources that were like free and available in Polish especially um, mm -hmm. for people to like, for example, learn DJing, you know? So this is what we did last year. We, we put out um, a DJing um, tutorial, which is a PDF um, with like instructions how to learn DJing. And it's for free. You can just download it from our website. Um, and yeah, and I do feel like the, the, this, this whole like gatekeeping uh, atmosphere has shifted a little and there is a trend of like, oh yeah, we should actually share this knowledge because, mm -hmm. you know, like some people like pretend that uh, using a CDJ that costs, how much does it cost? Like 1,000, no, 2,000 euros, which like obviously no one can afford, um, that it's like, like magic 
that it's a mystery. It's not, it's simple, but you just need like instructions. Um, so yeah, I do feel like now it's like opening up. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, but, but some things had to be done. And um, yeah, and also when it comes to our parties, like we, uh, w before clubs shut down, we organized parties regularly and we always always made sure that the lineup is um equally divided that you know it's uh at least 50 50 mm -hmm. uh male or female um yeah we organized also djing competitions which which is always um an interesting thing to see because like there's one case one person that uh sent a mix to our competition like uh, I think like two years ago that the mix was just completely mind-blowing and since then this person became an established uh, like you know an, a well-established DJ uh, and it's a woman um, so you know like uh, also opening uh, um, you know paths to people who you know don't have connections aren't friends with with djs or club owners or you know whoever works at the club and then you know being noticed by someone who actually cares about mm -hmm. the community about the community being open this is actually what actually well, this is actually something that happened to me as well a few years back when i also won a djing competition and then some people like encouraged me to to play more um also when it comes to solidarity um uh, another thing is fundraisers that mm -hmm. uh, have become maybe not the norm, but something that is, you know, like widely recognized mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, people understand when, um, when a certain party is collecting funds for, I don't know, access to abortion or plan B pills or, you know, something like that. Um, yeah, and another aspect of things that we have done that I also believe are that I also believe are some sort of some of solidarity is you know talking uh, and talking about and introducing safe safe space rules mm -hmm. in uh, like let's say like like underground but commercial clubs, mm -hmm. um, which is absolutely standard in many countries in the West, mm -hmm. but uh, hadn't been here. But yeah, but I do see that a lot of clubs have uh, uh, like taken notice and they have introduced safe space rules in their clubs and um, maybe lost some customers, but I'm sure they gained many more. Yeah, yeah, it sounds very much like this. And I remember when we were talking with Oliver Powerhead about, you know, the online version of this festival, the TTM coming up. This was my first concern, whether you make sure that you know, that you introduce also some sort of, uh, you know, rules of conduct and, and respectful sort of norms, even in this online space, because people might not even imagine, you know, the ways in which you can sort of misbehave in all kinds of ways. Also, I remember uh, with, with Zosia, we met uh, in Denmark some years back uh, during the preparation of, of a huge sex party, which became actually quite successful. It was really uh, nice in some very autonomous uh, space with some queer feminist collectives. And I remember when I saw the rules of conduct, which were 40 bloody rules. <laughs> I was terrified because on one hand, obviously I respected the desire to really, you know, make sure that all kinds of important things are there. But then my first reflection was like, why not making them three, maybe five? Because I cannot imagine people coming to a party and just reading a whole page, you know, packed with, uh, very detailed uh, prescriptions. I, I, I thought it was too much at the time, and I believe there are now very different ways of expressing uh, 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 this kind of concerns in a more uh, kind of uh, <laughs> a concise way. Okay, after Matt, I believe you also got some examples, so I would like to pass it on to you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, I, I really believe that um, good practice uh, in solidarity starts with uh, communication and starts with this like really direct and unambiguous communication of, as you said, the rules and also uh, the fact that uh, everybody uh, is equal in, in, in the eyes of, of um, any, any of the initiatives that were spoken about before. Um, uh, and what what we do in Oramix, and both in Oramix and and in Cieszki Brokat, the queer party that I hold, um, is uh, 
especially uh, putting putting like the weight on um uh, the fact that um that there is no discrimination and it's not going to be tolerated in the, in our spaces um and and uh, and also the fact that that uh, we are working on on the representation um the more you show people uh, that uh, women non-binary people queer people can uh, can do uh, as well or even um, or even better in terms of like how interesting their input is into the electronic music scene uh, the more uh, th these um, potential artists uh, become become um, you know encouraged to do so and encouraged to um, search for the for the knowledge and to uh, you know experiment themselves um, uh, I've actually been teaching uh, DJing for for a while now and and for almost two years now, it's been like uh, on a weekly basis. So uh, a lot of these uh, practices that that uh, we started implementing with Aramix and with Cieszki Brokat, I brought into the school, the, the the music school that I'm teaching right in right now. And um, um, and I feel like even the less uh, progressive um, spaces and and um, mm, clubs and streaming services have now started picking up on that and 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 uh, of course it's it's a process but um it's it's great to see how how it reflects in the real world um faster than than we really anticipated because everything moves so fast now and you know the trends come and go um so so it's like yeah it's a, it's a good thing to see mm -hmm. i'm uh, uh, curious now to what extent you think the um I, the very idea of uh, um, queerness and queer has shifted and has transformed the uh, electronic music scene do you have an experience of like non queer electronic scene and how you feel there i mean for me it seems that Queering the scene was an important, uh, a central factor that also influenced the way the music is produced, sort of consumed, mm -hmm. but also um, the, the generally the atmosphere in clubs and other venues that, um, that the music is being played. But I'm curious of, of also your kind of personal experience. Do you see a difference? Would you, you know, would you imagine, you know, dropping it again or, uh, or is it, you know, a part of experience that you think is somehow central? I definitely see a difference. Um, I uh, I find myself uh, looking at the um, at the very uh, hetero uh, male um, scene and 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 seeing how it has been taking itself so so seriously. And um, um, I feel that anything that was that was outside of this uh, particular you know style and particular um very sober and very very self-centered version of of electronic music was deemed unprofessional or or silly somehow you know and uh, and queer electronic music is is very much that it's playing it, it's playful it's it's a lot more uh, free in terms of the 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 expression that it's that it's um mm, that it offers you, you know, and and um, I'm trying to personally, I'm trying to to make it uh, known to everybody that um, these modes of expression are as well uh, are exactly as professional and as needed in the electronic music scene as the as the other types, you know, um, the uh, the more emotional, uh, you know. Um, aspect and and um um i'm missing a word here but like um the 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 approach to music which is completely different for queer people for women for you know uh to be honest everybody has a has a completely different uh, um approach to this uh and that needs to be celebrated the the, the pluralism in the mm -hmm. scene also the heterogeneity, perhaps, I don't know. I mean, I'm associating, you know, queer uh, in music and in other parts of culture, let's say, with this uh, book uh, by uh, uh, Jack Halberstam. I mean, it was published when 
they when, when he was still Judith Halberstam, so uh, now we should say Judith Jack Halberstam probably uh, the queer art of failure, where uh, where he explains how explains how explains how how you don't see those straight male traditional male subjects that suddenly opens a space for all others all other forms of subjectivity or, or all other forms of experience. And I believe this is exactly what happens if you take away this macho um, subjectivity from, from, from music, that suddenly all versions also of vulnerability that you, you mentioned in, in, in several of you mentioned in the previous parts of the conversation. So this vulnerability opens up. So there is something about, you know, perhaps a failure to accomplish this traditional music version or, or, or something that expresses itself, allowing, creating new uh, sensitivities, new formulas for uh, music making, new, new kind of experiences. Okay, if uh, anybody else uh, wants to jump in, please, please go ahead. I, I just wanted I to just add here that... On this expression when you can actually also build yourself like like build, build this new subjectivity but also kind of like go go beyond this and push it a little bit further and i think that this is also very interesting um in a way space uh, to observe and like to see what is actually happening within the club itself and for me like what kayetan was uh, talking about um like this this queering the queering the scene let's say for me, it's also it it happens um, within the the music we play, and because I have this feeling that for a very long time uh, the scene was occupied with one genre, like with, for instance with techno, and this was like the main thing you were playing in club, and this was mostly like this white cis uh, heterosexual guys playing one genre of techno or like tech house or whatever, and now I have this feeling that um, everything like kind of exploded. And everything is way more diverse. Even if you have a look at this uh, discussion we are in right now, and like uh, like four of us uh, playing and producing music, it's every everyone is in a completely different fa fairy tale, and it's a completely different like story in terms of music. And I think this is also beautiful when we talk about this. It's like how all of these differences and diversity also within the music genre itself they're kind of coming together and building the scene so then everyone can kind of come and not be not feel stupid of playing like this kind of a pop edit or the other pop edit or this this kind of music or the other kind of music so um yeah i just wanted I, to add, add this <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's fantastic and i believe it's creating uh, it's, it's also helping to create a new sound not just new uh, uh, atmosphere. I see some questions in the comments. I fi finally localized the comments, interestingly. So there is a qu there are several questions that I will put. I cannot log in the YouTube, so uh, I'm a very terrible moderator. I cannot answer the people straight away. Um, so basically, there is a question about burnout and kind of activist burnout. So if any of you want to jump on this, please go ahead. There is a question. There are some greetings from Kampala. Thank you very much. And also how how to gatebusters is what we need somebody says um, uh, so how to practice gate busting without gatekeeping is also a question so gate busting versus gatekeeping one question and question number two uh, which seems persistent is activist burnout so if any of you want to add to those topics please go ahead if you want to add something else also feel free Sosha? Okay, yeah, I, I wanted to um, quickly add to the safer uh, spaces policies because that's the topic that I've been interested uh, for a very long time. And I specifically say safer because I think no space and no sex can ever be safe. Um, and to me, like the idea of like a safer space policy is quite problematic because I think a safer space is a process and a practice rather than putting up like you know however you mentioned 40 rules for uh, for a for a sex party um and that and, and that is like questionable to me because like what comes afterwards after this poster like do we make sure that the people that are responsible for the 
door at a certain party are actually educated to deal with the situation that might arise. And I know this from experience where, uh, from the aforementioned queer festival where I was in a conflict mediation team. And at some point, we decided to give up the idea of a policy and rather have like a very educated conflict resolution team. And there were uh, often situations that I encounter for the first time like I learned about cultural appropriation 10 years ago for the first time and I at the beginning I didn't understand it and I think that's the problem with the safer spaces that we are often uh, it's often about like giving up your privileges but also about empathy to try to understand that like someone else's hurt might not make any sense to us and I think this uh, element of like practice and self-education self-criticism is often lost when we talk about safer spaces policy that it's a poster in the club entrance is not enough and um when it comes to uh, burnout, I think I'm like a really good example uh, because I experienced it very many times and uh, I just move on to the next thing. Like I felt I grew extremely disillusioned with punk community that was supposed to be this like safe for heaven and it was not. And the anarchist uh, and anti-fascist environment that, uh, you know, everyone had like the t-shirt anti-racist uh, feminist. But when you actually try to talk about like, I'm actually experiencing sexism from you, it was like, it's impossible because it says feminist on my t-shirt <laughs> or, like, or on the squad that we're at. So I moved on to the next scene. And uh, on then to the next scene, now I'm in, uh, you know, Oramix. And I think I prefer to be... Um, confronting like direct discrimination rather than um mm -hmm. then uh have this illusion that then this illusion, then, then this illusion. See, yeah i'm like missing your words i know that it starts with h <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically for me the burnout times are actually times when i'm writing so i'm using the burnout that you know the kind of activist burnout time to write so just an option to change, you know, the mode of action, yeah, the, the um, and I believe uh, for musicians and other creative people, it's exactly, it can be exactly the same, that you can mm -hmm. profit of this thing when you are exhausted and positively fed up with human beings, which can be super annoying, really, even if they have beautiful t-shirts and, you know, I have, I have this written on my t-shirt, yeah, it's really, um, <laughs> It's the last thing I can do. So I just uh, provocatively uh, put it on. But um, uh, just to remind myself also, you know, uh, in case I get really engaged that I should kind of uh, chill out. But I believe that uh, for the activist burnout, there is actually a notion uh, that I already mentioned, which I will repeat again, which is rabunkowa gospodarka na człowieku. This notion, so this robbery economy practiced on a human being. This notion in Polish is used towards the natural envirom environment. So if uh, uh, resources are being abused and if you, you know, drill oils and, and whatever, uh, gas, uh, then, uh, then you, we, you can you can you can speak of, of this robbery kind of economy and i believe it should be also applied so i've met uh, my first burnout was in ecological kind of activist scene and then i i realized that those ecologists so people who the first people to think about sustainability and kind of balance and everything were completely you know abusive in all kinds of ways yes yeah? so demanding of themselves and of others to be you know active 25 hours on 24 and all this and and i felt like oh my god this is such a paradox that we are preaching the kind of you know a balanced economy and respect and whatever and then as human beings we treat ourselves and and uh, and, and and each other as resources that can be just grabbed like this uh, so, so, so I, you know, so, so also responding to the those people who uh, view us on uh, on YouTube, my sort of immediate response to to burnout and this kind of phenomena is actually to treat ourselves as uh, with as much respect as we want the 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 nature to be treated. Yes, basically, if we feel tired, then probably it means that some sort of resource has been abused and and we have to we have to switch to some other form so um molly you've typed an answer uh, here in the chat but if you want to sp speak about it the this is the question from youtube it's not an answer yeah, it's not, uh, yeah uh, that's uh, the question uh, about burnout yeah and can, can any of you uh, type in the youtube that we are actually taking those questions ah, because okay. i can't <laughs> type in youtube i don't have a, all right yeah i will okay yeah. um yeah so any yeah after Matt, you want to talk? 
Yeah, um, I've actually experienced uh, a couple of uh, <laughs> activist burnouts in my time as well. Uh, and the last one was probably the, the biggest one um, where I uh, just put uh, too many uh, things on my own back um, because I felt uh, responsible for, for communicating, you know, uh, certain things. Um, uh, I've been arrested in, in August during the dur during the queer uh, protests. Uh, uh, actually, Paulina was uh, Dr. Surigeri was one of the persons who, who were trying to uh, um, <laughs> not make that happen. You know, um, and and after that, I felt this uh, huge responsibility that I created in my head uh, that I have to speak about this experience and and uh, somehow uh, you know amplify the 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 message of of the protests um and and if you yourself as you said Eva um burn all through all your resources in a very short time uh then at some point you you wake up and uh, you think to yourself I've just had enough you know I need to take a take a break and um uh, and I also think it's very it's very interesting how uh, being creative people we have this um, self healing therapeutic um, outcome uh, in music, uh, which which I actually used and and uh, uh, like when I when I was uh, really burnt out I just sat down and wrote a whole EP um, that came out of these these emotions and. Uh, so so yeah, but but also in our, in both in ceramics and in Czeski Brokat, we have this um, kind of fail safe that uh, um, that's like embedded in the rules of the collectives that says you only do as much as you feel comfortable doing. You know, um, if you're in a bad place and you can't really um, cooperate right now on something, you just say that out loud to the collective and nobody can, uh, you know, can berate you for that. So, so I think this is like a, um, a safer way of, of uh, um, treating um, both creative and activist burnout. Mm -hmm. I, I love this uh, idea and I regret that in many communities that I've been active, uh, in um, uh, for many years, this kind of respectful approach to uh, to human organisms basically um, has not been practiced. It's been it's just been a, a huge loss, and also lots of people were obviously stepping out of this activism towards um, completely other directions. So right now, uh, there are all those initiatives also for um, you know rest for for activism and and all this and. I find it absolutely amazing because we have to share also not only our failures, which used to be my focus for many years, you know, uh, how to, and also there is this notion from, you know, Walter Benjamin, uh, as we speak in a German festival, why not bringing some German Jews? Uh, so, so this notion of weak messianism, which is precisely the solidarity that comes across generations. But, uh, but this weakness in this weak messianism also means that the, the, the solidarity across generations is, is practiced by the, not the victors of the history, but those precisely who fail. So, so this notion of, of failure and being together in failure, you know, not being capable to do all those 200,000 emails or whatever else people have to do in all kinds of collectives, um, is also a moment perhaps to, 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 to be in it together and not to not to only practice solidarity outside, because we, like there is also this notion of you know support versus solidarity. This thing that uh, Bell Hooks uh, problematizes in in her book uh, when she speaks about you know support being delivered from above to b below basically, and then solidarity as being something horizontal that sort of consists in exchanging. And I believe that you know that that sort of. Um, being together in, in, in sort of crisis, exhaustion or, or, or whatever can lead uh, not only to exchanges, but also to other forms of creativity. We sometimes, you know, while consoling ourselves, I think with others, especially, we come across other forms, perhaps more effective and less exhausting forms of action. So there is also that part. Mm -hmm. Zosia? Yeah, I just wanted to somehow be this devil advocate. <laughs> I'm awful at resting. Also because like the what you me mentioned at the beginning, this like being constantly affected and living in the constant state of emergency, 
like I find it very difficult to cut myself off from what is happening in Poland and uh, disclaimer I don't live in Poland so I'm like safe from the direct uh, effect of some de government decisions but I'm extremely affected and uh, you know I can practice uh, healing on other people all I want but when it comes to myself it's often very difficult because I feel guilt when I stop and also I think because in Eastern Europe we are raised to have a thick skin on our butts that's uh, you know translating an idiom that I really like so it's it's I think it's really awesome that uh, the recent uh, protests have been uh, underlining the importance of resting and activist burnout but from my personal uh, experience I think also because I've been you know educated to be a femme person and Oh, and being a migrant, so I have to like, you know, perform uh, three times as better as everyone else. So all these things come into play. And uh, I think we should also talk about that, you know, rest is important, but how often do we fail at resting and... Um... Yeah, um, and why? Yeah, because it's, diff it's difficult to rest in this situation, you know, like every day you think like, okay, now we hit the rock bottom. And then another day comes and there's like another decision, another like shocking news. And then you're like, there's yeah, no why, end to this. That's why I used this notion of affective state of exception, because I wanted to put this exhaustion on the same level as the kind of state of exception, uh, you know, state institutional politics, because this is the extent to which we are get, getting exhausted. It's not that every six months, every one year, there is this scandalous, uh, uh, you know, event that we have to, that we feel obliged to react uh, emotionally, but it's on daily basis. You wake up and you don't know what next surprise is going to happen. Speaking of thick skin, there's just one thing, is that um, uh, there is, uh, there are some researches being made about Poland's use of, uh, uh, of anti uh, anesthesia, uh, painkillers, and apparently Polish hospitals uh, use the least of anesthesia in the whole European Union because of, uh, you know, dramatic historical events, because of a sense that, you know, people suffered the war. You cannot suffer, I don't know, a dentist without anesthesia. Wrong. So basically there is this sense that you have to endure all the, uh, you know, unnecessary pain just for the sake of it, <laughs> which is terrible. I had recently the IOD inserted without any anesthetics and I thought I'm going to die. And then I read uh, articles uh, online that actually it's one of the procedures that has the least amount of research uh, done on how to help patients through it. And uh, people in US, for example, demand full anesthetics to go through this procedure. <laughs> and no, now I understand. This is the problem. Poland doesn't do it. So basically we are brought up and we are growing in a culture which precisely makes... Uh, each of us into a hero because there is you know there is this notion of heroic kind of position that is very emphasized in Poland we have to be patriotic and fight the Warsaw uprising although you know it was over in 1944 but still we have to you know really have to fight it all the time uh, and this heroic notion of, of subjectivity has to be given up for for other you know this is why I like queer because queer is also about failure Queer is basically about failing to embrace the gender identity which has been coded in this heteromatrix uh, uh, binary mode, right? And if we fail to perform, you know, if I, I have like one meter, 80 centimeters, I'm really tall and also quite big. So if I try to perform this kind of vulnerable femininity, it's going to be a performance on its, on its own. It's going to be funny. Even if I do it perfect, you know, if, even if I, I, I make perfect makeup and perfect dress and whatever, if I try to pre present myself as this version of femininity, the kind of traditional one, it's go I'm going to fail. So basically my kind of embracing of, of, of queerness is also an embrace towards the failure to be this heroic, you know, communal for, you know, the, 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 the proper subjectivity. And I believe it must influence music in fantastic ways. Um, I think... Uh, uh, Doc Surge, Surgeri, sorry, you, Paulina, you have you have uh, something to say, right? 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to elaborate a little bit on this uh, activist burnout, but I would like to talk more from the cultural perspective in a way, because, for instance, uh, running a platform as Ramix, it's like a slash political slash cultural platform in a way, and everything we, we do, it's, uh, we do it for free. I mean, uh, it's like a free labor in a way, and uh, it really costs a lot of either emotions, frustrations, and your just spare time. And um, here I just would like to say that it's also like, a, like you know, the longest kind of speaking personally, the longest I do this and the longest I put my free time, my skills, preparing graphic design or like stuff for platform or like some information uh, stuff, the longest I'm just tired of this because, um, because we just don't get uh, recognition, recognition from the government or like from the municipality or from this kind of official uh, spheres that we kind of deliver something towards people that we also, that we also have an impact on society. We have impact on, I don't know, sharing knowledge, uh, building tools, building resources, um, actually like just delivering something positive to society in a way. And this is uh, with uh, each year, it's just, I think, getting much more difficult to kind of handle, um, especially with your normal life is, you know, also coming alongside. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that it's very difficult also to mm -hmm. to kind of exist in this, in this limbo without any extra support from any side. And basically, we are just this com underground community which just takes stuff from each other, which is also beautiful as a building networks, but... Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it has I, also yeah disadvantages. I believe that one of the ideas of Oliver Bauerhen, by the way, says that he's okay with me doing this anti thing. So, uh, so, uh, so basically, one one of one of his ways is also to to to, for instance, mix us in a, in in one discussion, because then you guys being maybe a little bit, um, how to say, emerged in the underground club scene you get to at least, you know, have a conversation with somebody who is not there. So basically there is an effort to make this conversation a little bit on the outside. And I believe this is also quite necessary. So at first I felt like, oh my God, I'm so incompetent on the level of like sound and, you know, music production and all these things. I, I cannot ask you competent questions about it, although I could pretend to do it and maybe you wouldn't notice, but in fact, that's the level of my incompetence. And yet on the other hand, the possibility of sort of reflecting on, you know, daily basis experience with people who are from some other uh, professional background is already a little bit, you know, an, a chance to sort of, you know, let, let go of some of the exhaustion or maybe fatigue or, or, or whatever. I mean, I remember that speaking of, you know, sexual revolution, which is somehow a background topic in, in what we are talking about. I remember reading the burnout tips from a retired sex worker an elder, a woman who was mainly doing this kind of most traditional sex work. And she advised in this burnout manual that pe people who do um, uh, work in sex work, they should spend some time with much younger and much older people, like people with, with different ages, basically. And I imagined this, you know, this woman, especially in her work outfit, sitting, you know, surrounded with kids of like five, six years old and giving a fairy tale to them. Yeah. So, so basically changing the environment, which seems impossible. I mean, for me as a theorist, it also sometimes seems impossible to change the environment because I'm so merged in it, yes? And my work consisting in, in theory making precisely makes me spend lots of time, most of my time with people who think in a very similar way and produce in a very similar way. And therefore this adds sometimes to this exhaustion. And also I believe that's the experience you're talking about is actually being merged solely in people of similar age perhaps, but uh, most importantly, making similar kinds of work. And then you don't get to rest. And the worst case scenario is if your partner or partners are from the same media, then you're doomed, basically. <laughs> I mean, I'm nothing <laughs> against this kind of... No, but, uh, okay, uh, Mori, you want to... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to add to that because, like you said at the beginning, uh, like we have a very similar political background. So I was part of this like political group um, for over 10 years and I surrounded myself with people who had very similar political ideas to mine 
also we were meeting at a squat which was like a space that was just completely like secluded from the outside world so um and and then of course i experienced an activist burnout because yeah that's inevitable um mm-hmm. but i wanted to say that for me changing the environment um from you know the one that you know everyone was an anarchist everyone believed you know that the state and capitalism is the devil and then you know when i kind of started djing more and i started like spending more time with like the the club crowd i it was so refreshing um so inspiring and i at some point i felt like i like developed much more you know mm-hmm. because i completely changed the the environment and then you know i was surrounded with people who you know like sometimes never discussed um mm-hmm. you know the horrors of neoliberalism or whatever you know um and that would be refreshing, yeah. <laughs> <Huh? Just laughs> that would be refreshing. i mean this is this is similar a, a little bit similar to my experience with children of my friends you know it's like the time yeah was like, You know, But, you they know, never in capitalism uh, neither and it's uh, so refreshing somehow. yeah but then <laughs> you know so you 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 go there and then you know you kind of want to like like uh, stir things up a little and it might be difficult in the beginning but uh but overall i've had a very positive experience and like and, this, and it was like very very inspiring for me and uh, and definitely gave me like a, a boost as an activist for a while um also one thing that no one mentioned <laughs> is i think that a lot of people are suffering from a burnout because of the pandemic mm-hmm. um and especially in like our field of work let's say when you know there's no like vision of playing anywhere anytime soon mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to be you know inspired to like keep organizing or like keep mm-hmm. even like recording music mm-hmm. because you know who knows when we're going to play so this is like this is actually like this is a question that i don't know how to answer because i've been struggling with it a lot like i'm i'm very lucky that i do get like mixes to record like every month or two mm-hmm. but i do have to force myself to mm-hmm. to do it um and mm-hmm. you know and it's kind of like feels more like tiring than touring every weekend in like two different cities you know Absolutely. like friday saturday Absolutely. you know um i'm i'm being asked right now to uh, to ask some of the questions that people write in the youtube thank you very much by the way to everybody who is with me on zoom but also to those people who are asking questions and commenting on 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 youtube it's beautiful that you send us so much su- support so basically one question is what could solidarity mean in the international club scene what are the practical ways to help people that suffer from their political context like polish artists do you do you do you guys need anything yeah please go ahead mori yeah well this is something that we have discussed like so many times because we you know as people from eastern europe which is you know this this like region where some people are still scared to go to they like i i believe like some people still don't understand that poland is in the european union and you don't like you don't need a passport to come here because i do feel like a lot of people like travel and then they stop in berlin and you can't really go you know further east you know mm-hmm. um so i do feel like um when we like experience major like political you know uh events in poland um we haven't been very like satisfied with the level of solidarity like international solidarity i'm going to be honest you know like there had like our, the compilation that we did uh, two, a year and a half ago two years ago i don't know But that was great. Yeah, because we asked people to contribute their tracks and we had 128 tracks from like different artists all over the world, but I do feel like a lot of people treat, treat this region as um I don't know, I feel like uh maybe they think that, you know, well, isn't this what you voted for? You know, mm-hmm. isn't this the government that you ch- chose? I'm like, hey, people voted for Trump. 
and people still showed a lot of solidarity for BLM in the States. So, uh-huh. you know, like, I, I think like we, we do need people to like come here and see for themselves that even though we live in a very harsh environment, so to speak, um, mm-hmm. you know, like the, when it comes to like the club experience is very similar to what you have, you know, in other places and we have amazing DJs. And that's another thing that um, getting recognition as a person who lives like on the Eastern like border of Germany and further uh, is like, like nearly impossible. Like if you don't move to like Berlin slash Amsterdam slash London, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, that's another thing that we need, like also like press coverage that like, that doesn't show us as like an exotic scene, but just Mm -hmm. as seen that exists on an equal level as others. Um, Mm -hmm. So that when we are in trouble, when we have those like huge political protests, people would be like, would, um, would be able to, to, uh, and I uh, forgot a word to just kind of like sympathize more in a way that, you know, oh yeah, I know these people and like, I can't believe this is happening to them because like, I, I do feel like a lot of this, like lack of international solidarity comes from the fact that people a lot of people like have never been here Mm -hmm. and they, you know, they just don't understand the dynamics here because it's like so much easier to show solidarity with like the places that, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, even people, yeah. Like even showing solidarity to the U S I don't believe a lot of people like Europeans have been to the U S but you know, they have no problem showing solidarity, but we are, you know, so like so close to the American culture, like pop culture that we kind of like, we understand it much more. And like, you know, our culture is, is something that is like unknown for a lot of people, but it's not that different for them, you know. There's also this assumption that precisely as Poland is the part of the European Union, it's gonna be European institutions who are gonna, who are gonna, you know, show some solidarity or so, so show some action. And the European institutions have been recently very much criticized for precisely letting, letting the, the Polish government do things which are completely um, neglecting the European law, like those zones, uh, uh, the, those uh, LGBTQ uh, free zones, which are illegal already on Polish grounds, but also which are illegal uh, in the context of European uh, law. So basically the European Parliament made one resolution in December 2019 condemning the LGBTQ free zones, and that's it. Okay, um, Zosia, you wanted to speak, please? Yes, I just wanted to mention that uh, Eastern uh, Europe doesn't uh, finish in on Poland, and I would really like to use this uh, attention that I have now to talk about uh, the campaign Highlight Belarus, and also pointing people's attention to scenes in Ukraine that is still at the state of war and scenes in uh, Russia that is now also going through some turmoil. And uh, there's a question about forms of international solidarity in the times of lockdown. Please educate yourself on the situation in these countries. The scenes are amazing and vibrant. Listen to the music by these artists. There's more and more really nice uh, editorials on these scenes, like even on really big um, media outlets. We also prepared uh, now a series on Belarus by the music of the artists invite them to the podcast like really it's about diversity and representation like techno is not only in berlin you know if you like industrial sounds like i i do there's an amazing scene for that also in russia and really um yeah just like google it <laughs> <laughs> and yeah and, hi- and highlight uh, belarus super thank you so much for this solidarity shout i'm uh... Really um, happy to to see it, especially in this context of protests in Russia. I don't know if you know, but there were protests in uh, whole Russia, including the high north regions where uh, uh, the temperature was minus 51 degrees. I think this was the record. And still some hundreds of people went to the streets to protest against the arrestment of Navalny and basically Putin's politics. So... I believe, yeah, now we can we can hear about it a little bit more. And uh, I'm happy that Oramix engages in this uh, support for Belarus and uh, other campaigns. This is, this is fantastic. 
Okay, we were given five more minutes. So if you want to talk more about forms of solidarity that you would recommend, the floor is yours. Also, somebody made this uh, fantastic comment, I think, which connects uh, the fear of anesthesia and the reluctance to, to offer it with fascist micropolitics. I think it's a very reasonable point of view. So just to shift the topic a little bit. Yes, this connection. So the, this, the, the fascist demand to, for, for, for citizens and for people to endure difficulties instead of you know, making suffering, making less suffering basically, um, uh, is a very fascist notion and it supports this heroic personality, heroic uh, political subjectivity, um, which is at the core of the fascist um, uh, uh, political uh, ideology and the fascist culture as well. So we are demanded to be those you know, brave heroes and the refusal, I think, to do it, I think inscribed in the queer politics, because I think queer is sort of immune to fascism in this way that, that it contains this failure to embrace strong, you know, strong subjectivity, strong political agency and stuff like this. I mean, it doesn't mean that it will never create um, effective politics, but effectivity is quite different from heroism and, and, and strength, I think. And, and to me, uh, this notion of queer as failure is precisely one which objects, which, which contradicts the, 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 the fascist politics. So this is why I, I find all the work that you do on every level of it, um, somehow a very nice and very effective response to fascism, which is not only you know, negating fascism, which has happened historically, and we remember from Rosbrat and other places, to what extent this kind of like, you know, saying no to fascism sounds quite similar to, <laughs> to, to the objected uh, uh, fascist entity. So if you say no to fascism in other ways than this, you know, brave heroicism, I think it can be also quite interesting. Anyways, um, okay, so we had the question about solidarity. So do you want to add some forms of solidarity, please? Mm -hmm. After Matt, if, if you want, please go. Ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, maybe first um, uh, about the question uh, uh, um, connecting the, the fascism and, and uh, the lack of uh, anesthesia. Um, I found uh, that, um, and that actually goes back to the whole topic of our conversation, to the um, effective states of exclusion, uh, because... Um, the strategy of, of uh, authoritarian governments and, and uh, the, the Polish government very much for the last couple of years has um, um, put us in, in this state of emotional overdrive, as we were, as, uh, as we said before, but also um, the, 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 they micromanage activists uh, in, uh, on, on some level. They uh, try to... Um, they try to engage them in uh, these completely inane lawsuits and uh, and arrests, and you know, um, it's it's trying to like suck the life out of the people who have had the energy to um, to do something and to be to stay active. Um, um, there's there's this strategy that's called slap uh, in English S L A P P. Uh, that's that's um, precisely that. That's like legislation based on. Uh, I mean, rather aimed at um, uh, occupying the time and resources and emotional states of the of the people that that you know dared to go against the establishment um, and and putting them actually out to pasture in terms of activism uh, and i've seen that happen to to many a friend of mine um, um so that's that but but then also going back to the question um of gatekeeping and gate busting uh which which i found personally very very interesting um i i think the only way to do that and we've been doing it with oramix uh, um a lot is is creating your own spaces and and um, not trying to uh, you know um, cozy up to someone that you find um, that you find interesting or or uh, valuable. Just creating your own valuable spaces and working from within and from a grassroots level. Uh, because if you do it right, it 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 has to be recognized at some point. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. 
Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone. And we still have four minutes. So if anybody has anything to add, please go ahead and uh, add it. We're going to go towards the CTM Discord uh, and the um, Oramix uh, people are already uh, logged in there. So uh, I'm happy to uh, confirm that this is happening and you're going to have the opportunity to discuss further on. But still, three more minutes. So if there is any favorite version of Solidarity, please go ahead. Also, one uh, good thing about Rosbrad Squad uh, is that uh, people from there uh, promoted for many, many years hygiene in contacts with police and other uh, state agencies. And I like this notion of hygiene, to, because generally hygiene um, in my um, kind of uh, anti-authoritarian uh, brain is associated with the um, fascist experiments and this kind of authoritarian version of you know biology and health and whatever. But then hygiene in contact with police, I think, is a very healthy <laughs> notion of how to uh, of how to proceed. And uh, 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 thank you, uh, Kayetan, for mentioning the uh, repression that is the wave of repression which is now practiced in Poland. Uh, and I believe that, uh, you know, a certain version of solidarity can precisely be to address these arrestments and to ar address those people, many of us who are uh, basically tired with all kinds of, you know, invitations to police stations for basically being in the street uh, on, a, on a Sunday afternoon. I mean, come on. Um, Molly, you wanted to add uh, something, or yeah, it was yeah, it was like funny that you mentioned this this thing about Rosbrad because like um, um, at Rosbrad there is still uh, this um, pro like yeah, it's not organization, but this like project called the Anarch the Anarchist Black Cross that is an international, it's an international thing and it was very funny um and I was actually talking to to my friends from you know from from Rosbrat um uh, about it a few months ago when you know the protests um uh, against the new abortion restrictions uh started in Poland and they became so massive at some point I remember going to like the you know, like a very popular news website, like Onet, like Polish people would know what it is, but it's like, you know, it's basically like, I don't know, CNN or something, um, <laughs> but would like with no TV. And I remember going there and seeing um, like the ABC of how to deal with police on the main page. Mm -hmm. And my, like my brain just exploded. I was like, is this a copy of what we did like underground 15 years ago yeah. all of this is like copy paste you know and then I, I remember sending it to my friends you know who who worked like you know in the anarchist black black cross and I was like guys our job is done like this <laughs> is like this is just like on on it and like vogue and whatever like yeah like everyone yeah, were, you know, is like, don't I, talk to the cops. Just like refuse to give any kind of information. And, and like, what to do if you're maced with like pepper spray? I'm like, oh my God, what is happening? Yeah. yeah so that was, that was major. Um, yeah. I saw a question. I, I saw a question on YouTube. So, someone said that, you know, the, the, the situation in Poland looks very grim. And if we have any hope for the future, mm -hmm. um, well, <laughs> we're Polish, so we're not the most optimistic people, but... Yeah, actually, actually, the Polish national anthem, I think it's a beautiful line to end this conversation as it's uh, already um, 7.35. So to finish this conversation, the, the national anthem of Poland actually begins with Poland is not over yet. Uh, yeah. as long as we leave <laughs> it's the first line of the I, I know the national anthem doesn't sound like a, the most radical resource that I could quote on the end but let's you you know let's let's queer it yeah let's 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 use it so if a queer theorist uh, and, and a authoritarian uh, musician or whoever we are if we we take this line seriously then we're going to notice that there is first of all a great amount of anxiety and uncertainty about the state of the country we are living in or we come from. And then on the other hand, there is a sense of belief that, um, you know, it can survive because of the people that are there. So basically, I think that what we learn about right now and what is the biggest hope we have 
is that the, the newest generations, the teenagers right now, who are screaming at priests saying that you know God is actually a goddess. Uh, th this is the <laughs> you know, this is the the, the 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 kind of hope that we are having, among other things, uh, and ourselves included. Okay, I would like to thank the CTM for hosting this uh, fantastic uh, discussion. It's been a long time since I uh, had so much fun. Uh, uh, thank you so very much uh, to all the participants. Uh, to um, Malacherba, to Aftomat, to uh, Molly Monster, to Doghead, Suri Gary, I pronounced it. Uh, pronounced it. Uh, thank you to Amelie Lille, who was our coordinator all this time. Thank you, Oliver Bauerhen. Uh, thank you, Jan, uh, Taisa, and everybody at the CTM. So I would like now to invite everybody to the Discord, the CTM Discord uh, server. Uh, our guests are already there. I'm not going to join you, but uh, you're going to see me one other day, uh, hopefully soon. So thank you so very much, everyone. And I yeah. will, we will probably go. Thank you. Thanks so much.